so excited to be talking to you today about what is dyscalculia? What is it? And today it's just going to be me, so let's just dive right in. That is the big question today. What is it? What does it look like? So first of all, I just wanted to tell you that it's not the result of poor teaching methods or the lack of intelligence or lack of education. That's not the deal at all. Instead, I wanted to share with you kind of the difficulties with defining dyscalculia that's laid out here in Steve Chin's book. And if you don't know who Steve is, be sure to check out our interview that we have with him. It's excellent. Okay, so in here he's talking about the diagnosing of it, the definitions of it, and how difficult that is. And we don't necessarily have a lot of consensus around this. The world doesn't 100% agree, big surprise. Um, but he's saying that the APA uses the word specific in their definition of developmental dyscalculia or DD. So there's another name for you. So it says, quote, a specific learning dis disorder that is characterized by impairments in learning basic arithmetic facts, processing numerical magnitude and performing accurate and fluent calculations. These difficulties must be quantifiably below what is expected for an individual's chronological age and must not be caused by poor educational or daily activities or by intellectual impairments. So it, you can't have those things happening. It has to be for those reasons, okay? So I thought that was really interesting. And they're saying that it's, it has to do with those individual deficits in numerical and arithmetic functioning, okay? And I think the Pfeiffer Assessment of Mathematics does a great job, by the way, um, because it breaks it down into subtypes. And so it helps you kind of understand how dyscalculia looks different for everyone. So the Pfeiffer Assessment of Mathematics, the FAM, has similar buckets that Steve is talking about here um, that he has you know, research that backs that up. So they have issues with core number. So difficulty with a basic sense of numerosity, like how much something is, how big is it? What does it look like? That's supertizing. They have issues with visual spatial. They have difficulties in interpreting and using spatial organization and representation of mathematical objects. They have issues with memory, difficulties in retrieving numerical facts and performing mental calculations accurately and reasoning, difficulties in grasping mathematical concepts, ideas and relations, and understanding multi-steps in complex procedures and algorithms. So the FAM has similar buckets to that, they're named differently, but that kind of gives us an idea of how complex it is to really describe what's happening because it is so individualized. Um, how many people does this affect? You might be wondering how much of the world's population is affected by dyscalculia. It's about three to 8% of the world's population. And David Geary has stated that about 50% of people with dyslexia also struggle with mathematics. They have dyscalculia. And you can read more about that at LD Online, which is linked up in this video below. So that's a significant chunk of people. And when we look at our student load here at Made for Math, yes, most of our students with dyslexia also have those struggles with math. Um, and so there's definitely a connection there, which is really interesting. Um, what another great question that I get asked all the time is what are some other names for dyscalculia? A lot of people have never even heard this phrase or what does it mean? Some other names that it's gone by and the differences again are slight and everyone's understanding of when to apply what label just is really dependent on lots of factors that I won't get into. It's a little complex, but it has to do with um, names other like math learning disability, specific learning disability with an impairment in math or developmental dyscalculia, DD. So it just depends on who's giving that diagnosis. There's some that are psychological, some that are um, in the DSM-5, some that are used by neuropsychologists, some that are, you know, it gets, it gets really complex. And Dr. David Geary and I talk about that a little bit in his interview. If you want to check that out, it'll be linked up below. What are some therapies and interventions that help students with dyscalculia? Well, we're big fans of Marilyn Zecker's work. That's what all of our team is trained on here at Made for Math. We put our people through her rigorous training and it goes all the way up into algebraic concepts. 
Um, and then also this training is available to parents and educators as well. You don't have to work just for us in order to get access to that. So we'll have that linked up for you. We highly recommend it. It's really excellent. Um, Dr. Schroeder, who I'm interviewing as well, has her own training and then we've done her ge geometry training, which is excellent and we recommend that. And then there's Dr. Sharma, who's been doing early morning trainings. Um, they're excellent and really good to get your hands on as well. And then Dr. Stephen Chin, sorry, Dr. Steve Chin has training as well, um, but because he's located in the UK, if you're US based, there's quite the time difference. You might be having to get up really early in the morning to enjoy his trainings, but his trainings take about a year to get through. Um, and then there's Christopher Wooden. Christopher works with Landmark and there's ongoing training over there. Um, they offer, I think, quarterly. There's various math classes, just depends on Christopher's availability. And then lastly, there's Making Math Real by David Berg, who's out of California. It used to be all in person. However, with the pandemic, they've been able to move everything online. So you should be able to access his method from wherever you want in the country. But again, I'm a little biased. I love Marilyn Zecker's method. I think it's top notch. And I hear time and time again from my team when they go through it, why didn't anyone teach me this way? This is really effective. This is so good. Um, okay, and then the last thing that people might be wondering is what should you do if you suspect your child has dyscalculia? So the first thing you could do is take a screener for it. And we talk about these at length with Dr. Schroeder. So check her video out. But basically it will give you a score that says, hey, it's kind of likely your kid probably has this learning disability. And then at that point, you would want to go ahead and schedule with someone that has the authority to give a diagnosis. So someone like Dr. Karen Wilson, who's a neuropsychologist that we interview in another episode, and if you want to hear more about that diagnosing experience, she's going to be going into details about that in that episode. So those people have the right tools and assessments to be able to give an accurate diagnosis. And the reason why you would want to go get one is so that you can get additional accommodations at the school level, but also a better understanding generally of your child, the way they're wired, the way they think. It's one of the most powerful things that I know of that have helped me tremendously in raising and parenting my own children. Okay, well, we gotta wrap this up with a math joke, of course. Let me share my screen with you. All right, I'm on a diet. I used to eat six slices of pizza. Now I just eat three. <laughs> All right, guys, have a good one.